things. Okay, uh, good morning, uh, everyone. I hope you are totally refreshed after the weekend, and I hope you had a good weekend. Okay, I think uh, I, I had a good weekend. Thank, many thanks to Anurag and Ashwarya. You know, we had uh, they brought me out. It was uh, eye opener. Okay, eye opener. Mumbai was an eye opener. And uh, I suddenly realized why Prof. Juneja told me he hardly ever goes out of IIT Bombay. <laughs> you know, but yeah, it's a it's a big city, lots of traffic. I, I, it's a it's a new experience for me. Yeah. Okay. So today we are going to sort of we are now coming to the the tail end of the thing. Today there will be a full hour, full five hours. Okay. I hope to give you some ideas about how to apply models and how to use models. Uh, I. Do not know uh, before I start. Uh, actually, I'm not. I just thought maybe I just want to clarify. I'm not an advocate of constitutive model modeling per se. Per se, uh, actually, I don't do a lot of work on constitutive model. I mean, the one that you saw the other day, the paper I, I talked about was uh, I gave it to. I think I gave it to you, right? Uh, that paper was uh, is one of those one of the very few attempts. I had a few more earlier attempts on. But really, I think you should do only constitutive modeling if you. Need it. That's why I felt. You know, I mean, it was a. Uh, I was. I was quite surprised when I was finishing my PhD, 1985. Andrew Schofield attended the 1985 San Francisco International Conference of Soil Mechanics and Foundation of Engineering and Foundation and Geotechnical Engineering in San Francisco. And he came back and he told me, he said, Lee, you better. Uh, I wouldn't advise you to do constitutive modeling. I looked at it and I said, Are you out of your mind? You know, because you are you got famous doing constitutive modeling, and now he tell me not to do constitutive model. He said, "You know how many constitutive models there are in presented in San Francisco, nineteen eighty-five, a few thousand, okay? And by now, two thousand and fifteen, thirty years on, probably fifty thousand or there about constitutive modeling models. And if you ask yourself, who?" Is using that constitu those constitutive model, the guy who wrote it, and no one else. The only constitutive model that are used 99.9 percent .9 of the time is more Coulomb. Okay, there are a few exceptions like uh, people using a bit of soft soil hardening, soil chem clay, that kind of thing. But anything more complicated, you know. I mean, I always tell people that I had a very interesting. I don't know whether you know this guy called Mark Randolph from Western Australia. You know, a very famous guy doing power foundation. He's in Western Australia, and Andrew Whittle from MIT spent a, a year during his sabbatical with them to code his MIT E3 model into into uh, Mark Randolph's code, you know, the Ritz code. And uh, Mark Randolph said it's useless because no one knows how to use it properly. The moment you use it, it just jumps out of the whole thing. The moment it starts running, it just it just about completely about the run. It just totally unstable. So basically, no one know how to use the thing. So basically, the question, of course, that who is using Andrew Whittle's model? The answer is obvious, Andrew Whittle. You know. So basically, he, Andrew Schofield was the one who told me. He said, "Look, you're not going to get very famous doing constitutive modeling going forward because there are just so many people doing it. You, know? you want to do something? Uh, constitutive model has become very big business. Too big, actually. Too big. So." So basically, I my advocate is that you should try to your. I mean, in the engineering world outside, you would use the standard model. I think most of the time, you won't even have the time to write. In research, I would say that yes, you can develop if you feel that there is a clear need for something new that you can make a statement on. But other than that, I would say you know, uh, if you are going to develop another one that is to that, that behaves like cam clay, my question: Why don't you use cam clay? If you're going to develop something like more Coulomb, why not use more Coulomb? You know that that's the kind of thing. So, so basically, I'm not a great advocate. In fact, I never started. I never. My early work wasn't done. On, I was doing centrifuge modeling. Okay. Even now, in fact, some of my uh, most active lines of research are in uh, ground improvement, not in constitutive modeling. Okay. So this is a thing. Now. So basically, I just thought at this point of time, uh, I just. Quickly recap. This is the tail end, and today what I would like to do, I spend the bigger part of today on modified cam clay. Uh, maybe up to lunchtime and a bit. Maybe see, we see how it goes. I have no experience doing this this format, so I'll have to prod along and see. 
the second uh, the second thing i want to do is to give some hints on how you run practical numerical analysis which i think is also quite important because knowing the constitutive model is just part of the equation you know and getting the other things right in an fem is also another part of the equation which i think it's oh, oh, and in fact it's not, there is more objectivity in that in those parts there are usually more objectivity so uh, i i actually spent about uh, there was a period uh, between 2003 2002 and 2000, 2008 when i was very actively advocating people to use three dimensional finite element analysis and uh, it's uh, now i think the things are catching on i think maybe not because of me but because plexis come out with plexis 3d and so everybody said it's now it's so easy to use i'll just use it but but essentially yeah that's that was one of my message so i had some experience doing fairly practical work and practical related work on fem so i thought maybe i'll share some of uh my experience with you so that uh you can also we can also learn from each other and if you have experience and you would like to share with us i think that's more than welcome okay okay so maybe with that i i will start now okay now the before i before i go on to modified time clay i want to sort of i would just like to spend maybe about 10 15 minutes just recapping what we did maybe five to ten minutes what we did last friday because uh the weekend i'm sure has done a lot to our memory i'm not sure whether you i can't believe you sit in your room studying that's to be honest that's an honest opinion <laughs> you know i'm sure you're going out ah, just like me take a look at mumbai you know so basically uh so maybe i'll just quickly do a quick revision on cam clay so that we are all on the same frequency when we go into modified cam clay uh it's a it's a we are on the same same page okay now the cam clay model and the modified cam clay all belong to a large class of model encompassing many many models okay the drucker praga cap the cam clay the plexis hardening even the soft soil model is same thing now it is impossible to cover all and so we will use the cam clay original cam clay whoops okay okay uh, I will, I will, I will just quickly go through. I won't go through one by one. You know, uh, essentially, the cam clay is built upon Donald Wood Taylor's stress dilatancy equation. I think you know that uh, you have seen this before. So, essentially, the idea of stress dilatancy is that it is an expression of, on the left hand side, external work done, and on the right hand side, frictional dissipation. So, in a sense, if you rearrange this this set of terms appropriately. You'll find that it actually represents the external work done, and that includes the dilatancy as well. All right. On the right hand side, you've got a friction coefficient, which is the internal friction coefficient. That actually represents the amount of energy dissipated by friction. Okay. And Taylor basically admits only energy dissipated by friction. Okay. So this is the way it worked out. This is the dilatancy equation. And so Cam Clay uses that dilatancy equation and converts it to uh, that was Schofield. Okay. The genius or the 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 cowboyness of uh, Andrew Schofield, who basically took that and then just and somebody asked why can, how can you use sand for clay? Now that's the you can call him genius or you can call him any old how. Okay, basically that's Andrew Schofield. Anyway, that's uh, he's quite a character. Okay, so anyway, this on the left hand side you can see this is the work done by the deviator stress acting through the mean the generalized shear strain. That is the mean effective stress, the work done by the mean effective stress acting against, acting through the volumetric strain. That is actually dilatancy, the work done by dilatancy. All right. And this is the internal energy dissipation. And so this was the basic energy equation. And Andrew Schofield uses this as a flow rule. All right. So he went through the whole process of calculating, and the result comes out with a teardrop shape like that. Okay. And, uh, this basically has a point of intersection at P0, P0 prime or P0 prime at this particular point where Q equals to zero, where the Q hits zero. Now, this line here is the critical state line and the critical state line always passes through the crown of the U locus, of the U locus, okay? So, in a sense, this is both the plastic potential and the U locus. So, it is, if you like, associated flow rule, all right? Now, you might ask why there was a lot of discussion about people amongst people as to why associated flow rule and non not non associated flow rule. You just imagine this is already quite more quite a bit more complicated than more coulomb in those days. 
And now if you put in non-associated flow rule as well, it's going to be even more complicated. So there's every incentive to make things as simple as they as we can afford to make make it. So the associated flow was felt to be simplest and people said, well, let's try that and see whether it works. You know, that's the way it works. So basically this is the, the way the, 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 the associated flow rule comes about. But it seems to for soft clay the Associated flow rule is reasonably accurate. The angle between the stress, the strain increment vector and the U envelope, the tension to the U envelope is typically about 75 degree to maybe 100 degree. So if you say, okay, average about 90 degree is all right. You know, but for sand, yeah, it can be quite far off. Okay. So this is the general kind of understanding. Okay. So anyway, um, we associate the, now this one, we're going to do it in a short while, very short while. So we went through the whole thing on this uh, cam clay and what we said was that essentially there's one thing I just want to mention to you and that is that essentially the cam clay U locus is strung out. This is the U locus itself and the region underneath the U locus is what we call the elastic wall. It's the elastic regime and the base of that elastic wall which is this line over here is actually an unloading reloading line. Okay, And the P0 prime for the corresponding to this U locus is actually here. This is the P0 line. All right. And this is the normal compression line. And this second line over here flying through space is the critical state line. Okay. So the way you would imagine uh, this cam clay, and now I'm going to come back to this. Okay. So basically, just to orientate you, and this is important just to get the idea clear, uh, it's a three dimensional thing, and you must always think in terms of three dimension three-dimensionality, I, I need to get my, this, uh, okay, so this axis, this axis over here is the V-axis, okay, this axis over here, I'll just, just put it out, this axis coming out, going out this way is the P-axis, and this axis is the Q-axis, Q okay, so essentially you can think of the U-locus, uh, okay, this, this is one of the elastic wall. It looks a bit flat, but if by right, it should be a curve. It should be a curve, okay? Uh, and it should be. It should not cut through the uh, the v axis because the v axis corresponds to p p dash equals to zero. At p dash equals to zero, the white ratio is infinity. Infinity, right? So it should actually co curve this. Anyway, not doesn't matter. As long as you know roughly, this is the way it works. Then it's okay, okay? So in the essential thing, the important thing is this three-dimensional thing, okay? And I went through a whole series of animation to show you how cam clay behave, all right? Now, we have seen that basically the rule is very straightforward. There are, if you're on the wet side, you have to approach the critical state line. On the dry side, you go this way. Now, if you are looking at a soil that is undergoing a drain test, in a drain test, then... Uh, you would follow a plane that is inclined like this on a three to one, on a three to one. Okay, so this plane, if you if you think of the intersection between this plane and this curved surface, it traces out a curve. That is your drain state path. And if you project your drain state path back to the stress space, which is the wall of the house, you will get a three to one. You get back a three to one. Clear? So this is the way it works now. On the other hand, if it's undrained test, then it is along this kind of vertical plane because V is constant. V is constant. So again, you do the same thing. You do an intersection and you will get your stress path. So so you get your state path, the way it goes and how it is. But essentially, V is a constant anyway. So the stress path will, looks like it's coming up. So when you project onto it, you will see that leftward curving curve. Okay? Leftward curving stress, stress path which basically tells you that there is excess pore water pressure. Now, this is the scheme at which cam, uh, uh, cam clay works, and it's the same for both original cam clay and the modified cam clay. Now, there's one important thing that I want to highlight to you, and that is heavily over-consolidated soil. That was a one point that I forgot to highlight, and I thought maybe I should highlight to you, and that is that a lot of people don't realize that actually, the critical state line, it is important to understand. The critical state line is actually this line, the blue line that's going through space. Okay, what you see when Q equals to MT prime is merely a projection of this critical state line onto this wall of the house. Alright, 
Now, and if you come out, if you take a drain test on the dry side of critical, on the dry side of critical, you you would you would imagine that there is a kind of a plane that cuts through like that, cuts through the thing like that, and so it will hit this guy, and then it will slide down along here, right? It will slide down along there towards the critical state line. Now, at no point out during this thing uh, does it ever intersect the critical state line. That is the important thing. Now, I was uh, 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 there are some research workers, even today, I'm very actually surprised. Uh, maybe they, they haven't undergone a formal lecture system on critical state soil mechanics. And I was talking to a guy from China, a professor, from China, associate professor from a Chinese university, and he told me that chem clay cannot, chem clay cannot, let me just, let me just draw it out for you. You know our, whoops, oh, for our heavily over consolidated soil, Okay, heavily over consolidated. This is the this is the critical state line. That's the U envelope. Okay, imagine now we are going doing a drain test. The drain test will tell us that essentially the stress path will come up, hit the U locus, and then come back down the critical state line. Correct. Okay. Now on this projection, on this projection, the the gentleman. All right who has been researching on cam clay and how to improve cam clay, told me that cam, it can, this cannot happen because he said you are actually intersecting the failure envelope, which is this line. And I, I was, it took me a long time. I'm not sure, even sure whether he was able to understand it because it was just, I only had about half an hour to convince, try to convince him that in fact, you, are not, you should not be looking at it in two dimension. You should be looking at it in three dimension. And when you look at it in three dimension, then you realize, Actually, it is not intersecting the critical state line. So I hope that you all can internalize this point because a lot of people were caught out by this point. They cannot understand how come the U envelope can be higher than the failure envelope. But in fact, they don't understand that the, the, the failure line is just a projection of this true failure line. Is that alright? Okay, so basically, that is how the cam clay works. And I basically went through a whole series. Have you all got that the, those programs, six programs? Have you downloaded it or got some something? Huh? Have you all got it? The exe file? Hey, I thought I passed it to you. Is it? Huh? You all got it, huh? They didn't collect. Huh? Okay, so it's your fault. <laughs> so you better go and chase them. So basically, uh, we I I I, I mentioned. I think I gave it to this gen you right. I think what what you give it to them already. Okay, 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 okay. So anyway, I think can you all make internal arrangement to, to, to get it? So basically, those programs hopefully just animate it for you to show you how to stress power flows. Okay, to help you to kind of visualize what is going on. So that is really what cam clay is all about. And today we want to push on from cam clay. Now, I want to talk a little bit about, today I want to talk about modified cam clay because it turns out that, oh, by the way, by the way, I also talk about the stress path of cam clay and how it is related to the A value. The A value, right? And I told you that cam clay generally over predicts the excess pore water pressure, original cam clay. And it always, it usually tends to, pre it, it, because of the fact that it over predicts the excess pore water pressure, it also tends to over predict the A value, the A parameter, the A parameter. Okay? And that is because if for cam clay, this cap here is very gentle, it comes forward like a teardrop. That's no, um, people come, come to the, People are of the general opinion that this is not quite the way the cap ought to be shaped. The cap is a bit steeper than this. Maybe a bit, it should come down a bit like that. Okay? So today we are going to look at modified cam clay. And in fact, uh, other than GeoFEA and the old version of Sage Crisp, uh, I don't think the original cam clay was ever, has, is ever implemented in other software. When other software talk about cam clay, they always talk about the Roscoe Berlin cam clay, which is the modified cam clay. Okay, which we are going to do today. But the basis, the framework is exactly the same. The only thing is that there are some differences. Okay, so with that, maybe I will just go into the modified cam clay. Okay, now I just want to revisit two slides. Oops. I just want to revisit this slide. Have you got this slide under cam clay? I think original cam clay, you have this slide. Right? Now, I want to say something about the, this slide is basically a slide to tell you what's wrong, what's wrong with the original cam clay. 
you remember that the original Kemp clay flow rule or the energy equation is given by this. This is the energy equation of the original Kemp clay, right? This or okay. So if you take this as a single variable, the the that the epsilon V P over the epsilon S P, which is the the ratio of the strain increment vector, all right, the the direction of the strain increment vector or the gradient of the strain increment vector. You're gonna you take it as a variable, and you take eta as another variable, stress ratio as another variable, and if you look at this as a two variable equation, this is y, this or this is x, and this is y. You realize that the relationship between x and y is really a linear equation. In fact, it's a linear equation with a gradient of one, right? So basically, if you plot this equation out on a plot that looks like this, where the x-axis is the epsilon V P over the epsilon S P, all right, okay. And on the y axis, you have the stress ratio. You actually, this equation will actually give you a straight line that looks like this, okay. So that when this term equals to zero, eta equals to m. Clear? So it comes out here. And when this, uh, sorry, eta equals to m. So, uh, eta equals to m. Correct. When this is zero. And then when eta equals to zero, when eta equals to zero, this is equal to m, and so it's the reverse. Okay, it is the reverse. So basically, it looks like a straight line. That one. Now, the test, the proof of the pudding uh, in of a constitutive model for modeling work, for modeling work is how well we obviously reproduce real behavior. All right, and we can say that Cam Clay can reproduce something that more Coulomb cannot reproduce, but. When people start looking at uh, original Cam clay after it was published in the, I think the early 60s, they found that there was some problem with the original Cam clay because the real data for when they plot, when they try to use triaxial data to see whether the triaxial data follows this from train test, uh, follows this relationship, they found that okay up to here, uh, this is not very well drawn, but I really the data will bunch up along here up to here. But as you get down to here, the data starts to swing over to the right side. The data starts to swing over to the right side. So basically, in this region, there's a lot more discrepancy, a lot more discrepancy. Now, if you look at this region here, if you look at this region here, what is the significance with this region? This is the region when eta is low. The stress ratio is low. Is that alright? So this is the low stress ratio region. Now, what do we mean by low stress ratio region? The row, the stress ratio is Q over P prime. So when we talk about low stress region, low stress ratio region, we're really looking about we're talking about this region over here. This region over here. So in around this region over here, the energy equation of the Cam clay is not very good. It doesn't work very well when you compare it with real soil. Is that alright? With high stress ratio, it works better. Okay, and in particular, in particular. If you look at this equation, all right, when eta equals to zero, all right, based on this equation, eta equals to zero, the epsilon V P over the epsilon S P is equals to m, all right, because the epsilon V P over the epsilon S P equals to m, you just cross multiply, the delta epsilon S P equals to delta the epsilon V P over m. Now, you realize that this, when eta equals to zero, you are having an isotropic compression situation. So this equation is telling you that when you compress a soil isotropic, the guy actually distorts. Now this is a lot of people consider this to be counterintuitive. You take a lump of a ball of soil, you compress it isotropically, you expect it to compress isotropic, the, the strain to be volumetric, no shear strain, and yet the guy from a ball can change to an ellipse, can change to something else. So this is rather a funny kind of material, in a sense. You see, that's why the guy who prescribed the model. Cannot think about everything, so there will always be some defect here and defect there. So basically, what happens is that this is a model that cannot undergo pure volumetric compression. There must always be some shear stress when it is yielding, some generalized shear strain, some shear strain when it is yielding, and uh, and so this is the defect. Basically, what you would expect is that okay, let's supposing this is a lump of soil. And you compress it isotropically. You expect to see only what volumetric change. All right. Say it's a ball of soil or cube of soil. You compress it. You put in a triaxial test. How do you compress isotropically? Just raise the cell pressure. No ram load. 
no RAM load, just raise the cell pressure, allow it to consolidate. You expect it to, to see only uniform compression. It's like volumetric change. No, no, no distortion of the soil. Okay. Now, in that, in if you if that is the, the thing you expect to see, then what you expect to see is this thing equals to zero. Because there's no shear strain increment. Right? It is it should be equal to zero. And if it is equal to zero, then this thing, because this term is equal to zero, because this term is zero, then delta epsilon VP over delta epsilon SP will be infinity. So theoretically, theoretically, this line here, this straight line should not cut here. It should come if you if your expectation is correct. And that's what the real data appears to show. So there were a lot of complaints. And it, it basically complain people complain to, to, to Ken Roscoe that hey look, around here, firstly, your U locus seems to be wrong because the actual U locus seems seem to go like that. And then the worst thing is when I comp when I when I when I shear when I when I put, put the soil into yielding in here, when I put the soil into yielding in here, I can't get a strain increment vector coming straight out, which I sh I expect to see. I expect to see a strain increment vector coming straight out because that is pure volumetric compression. No shear strain, right? No shear strain. But in fact, because of the fact that this guy cuts this thing at an angle, there will always be at right angle a certain shear strain, a certain inclination. And so as a result, people say, hey, look, this is not real, you know. This is counterintuitive. Okay? You are telling me that when you compress something uniformly, isotropically, you somehow the thing can distort. You know, it's a rather weird kind of scenario. So that's what they, they that, that was what was fed back. And so they, they, they had to do something to it. So essentially, essentially, if you look at it, basically, they, they should, they, people expect to see a rounding off of the U surface. They expect to see a rounding off, okay, of the U surface. And that this ve vector over here, and they expect to see this vector going horizontally. They don't expect to see it going up at an angle, okay. Uh, whereas the cam clay, and this is the corner that Andrew, remember I told you the story about Andrew giving a lecture, telling me how Berlin, how John Berlin took out his nice corner. This was the corner he took it out. But this was the corner that caused all the problem. You know? So, I mean, I was sitting in the car, and I was driving, and he was telling me, cursing and swearing away at John Berlin. And as for taking away his nice corner, and I was wondering to myself, driving my car, am I going mad? You know? So, that, that is the, that, that was the, the situation. So he said, there's a very nice corner in something. No, you shouldn't take it out. And I said, what's the, so nice about a corner? You know? So anyway, that, that was the basic objection. So that, <coughs> okay, John Berlin was actually a South African. John was a South African. Although he stayed in UK the whole life. He's, I think he's retired now. Huh? I think he's retired. Because David Potts is retired. So John must have retired. Uh, and he came from South Africa. He went to do a PhD with Roscoe. And one of, uh, we call them the unholy trinity, you know, Schofield, Roth, and Berlin. Uh, I mean, Roscoe has a lot of students. He's got people like uh, Purusha, Raja, and the rest of it. But these three are the most infamous, the most famous or infamous, okay, for their work, okay. So anyway, John Berlin was, uh, was, came in just after Andrew Schofield produced or wrote, Schofield and Roth produced their Critical State Soil Mechanics, you know, and a book Critical State Soil Mechanics by Schofield and Roth, I think it was written in 1968, 1960. So at that time, it was, a, it was a lot of attention paid to this kind of problem. And so Roscoe asked John Berlin to see if he can solve this problem, okay? Now, John Berlin is a very astute character, okay? John Berlin is a very astute character, okay? Um, and John Berlin realizes where the problem is. You see, if you look at the Cam Clay work equation, if you look at the Cam Clay work equation, the Cam Clay work equation only has. Let me just bring you back to the Cam Clay. Let me see whether we have the Cam Clay. Oh no, don't have. I, I'll write it out. I'll write it out. I'll write it out for you, so we don't have to flip that page again. Okay, P dash delta epsilon V P plus Q. Delta epsilon SP equals to M times P prime delta epsilon SP. Agree? This is the original Cam Clay work equation. All right. Now he realized what was the problem. He realized that the problem was that on the right hand side there was only one parameter and that is shear strain. You can only dissipate energy by shear strain. 
So we are, we are telling the soil, the soil can only dissipate energy by shear strength. But we know that when you do isotropic compression, if the soil undergoes volumetric, pure volumetric change, it is obviously dissipating energy. If not, then where is the energy going? You know what I mean? So basically, John Berlin realizes that there is this thing. But of course, if you ask people now, what is the physical meaning of that? It's very unclear. But anyway, never mind. John Berlin is very, very is a very smart cookie, and he realized that uh, that is the case. So basically, this is the deficiency in the energy. Basically, so what he says is this. Okay, uh, why don't we put in this additional term on the right hand side now? This is where the difficulty starts because. If you put in this term, you just say this plus this is equal to mp prime delta epsilon, the epsilon sp plus p prime delta the epsilon vp without the square and the square root sign, without the square and the square root sign, all right? It actually reduces almost to the same equation as this because at critical state q equals mp prime. You know what I mean? So it, it, it's a trivial equation, but John Berlin some, this some mathematical trickery mathematical trickery and that is unexplainable. That's why I say I don't want to start with a modified chem clay because it's a very difficult to explain. Sometimes when people do constitutive model, they make assumptions that uh, it's not easy to explain. So people in, who write paper, if you ever write paper in constitutive model, the word that you would use is it is postulated that. That means I think it is like that or I assume it is like that. But it's a nice way to say it is postulated that. This is what is happening. You know what I mean? It's just a simple way of saying. Actually, I can't explain it, but it's like that. You know? <laughs> so basically, John Berlin put in this thing. So instead of the this term, he now got this thing over here. Okay. Now this thing over here immediately relaxes the equation because it puts in an additional term, the epsilon VP. All right. Now you may ask me, hey, why are you put in the epsilon VP and why you square all of this and you take the square root? Now this is actually if you look at this, uh, the, in mathematics we call it the two norm. The two norm means you got two two quantities, two quantities, okay, x1, x2. You take x1 squared plus x2 squared, square root the whole thing. That's the norm, two norm. That means if you have n quantity, x1, x2 to x3, x4, xn, and you take x1 squared plus x2 squared plus x3 squared plus x4 squared plus x5 squared, Add them all up and take the square root. It's like the sum of the square root, the square root of the sum. All right, okay, sum of square but square root. Okay, that is called the two norm. Now, why he takes the two norm is something that nobody can fully explain because on the right hand side is energy. Energy is a scalar. If you take two norm, you only usually use it if you are finding resultant. You know, what I mean, a force in the x direction, force in the y direction. Therefore, the resultant is equal to x force in the x direction squared plus force in the y direction squared then square root squared, correct that is how you would do it but energy why the hell you take two norm why there's no energy in the x direction and no energy in the y there's no such thing all right so basically this is the part that is unexplainable with the modified time clay and so people just come to accept that this is just Berlin's assumption which is he used to overcome the, the difficulty is that all right Okay, so it's not something that is easily explained. Okay, now there is one other thing I forgot to mention about is that there is one basic problem with the original cam clay. When you put an original cam clay into one dimensional consolidation, which I didn't show you, all right, if you put the original cam clay into one dimensional consolidation, you can actually easily show that K0 is always equal to 1, which is rubbish. You know what I mean? That cannot be real, all right. K0 is equals, always equals 1. That is obviously unreal. Now, on the other hand, on the other hand, with this thing, you can actually show that under one dimensional compression, K0 is less than 1, although it's still higher than Jakey's relationship. Okay? Uh, typically, the modified time clay for a typical soil of about 24 degree friction angle will give you a K0 of about 0.8, whereas Jakey will give you about 0.65. So, K Cam clay is typically about 0.15 of J keys. Okay, I'm not saying J keys is correct. Actually, a lot of people think J keys is wrong, but J keys is the most widely used. You know J keys relationship, 1 minus sine phi dash? That is singularly the most widely used. But when you look at J keys paper, you know, there were similarly number, huge number of assumptions there. So 
It's all theoretical. By the way, Jackie's is never, it's not empirical. That relationship is not empirical. It's completely theoretical. And there's a lot of assumption there. So essentially, uh, I'm not saying which is right, whether Berlin is right or Jackie is right or whatever, or somewhere are both wrong. Most likely both are wrong. Okay, and somewhere in between is probably a better deal. But The issue is that it is seen to be a bit off. And that actually has some bearing on the plexus thing. I'm going to come back on the plexus later on to explain to you what is the difference between the plexus model and the cam clay model. The plexus model is not actually a critical state model, although they also use the same kind of use surface. Okay, so now we come to this. This is the work equation that Berlin used. And if you go through the set of mathematics again, and you substitute in the associated flow rule. This is the associated flow rule, which says that the gradient of the strain increment vector multiplied by the, the gradient of the U surface is equal to minus 1 at that point. Is that okay? Ah, that then allows you to get rid of this term, the epsilon SP over the epsilon VP, the epsilon SP over the epsilon VP, and replace it by DQ over DP prime. Okay? And so when you do that, you end up with an equation like that. And I won't bother to show you how to solve, but you square both sides. And then you end up with some equation that looks like that. And you then have to make a substitution that uh, Q equals to eta times P prime. Q equals to eta times P prime. And then you replace Q, the, quant uh, the variable Q by eta, and then you enter the substitution. And the result that comes out, the result that comes out, to cut the long story short, after you have put in the constant of integration and all that, like just like the original cam plane. The mechanics, the way you solve it is just like original cam plane. All right? The way you, the equation is a different, dif different types of differential equation. You need to use separation of variable to actually do, do the solution. But it's, ultimately, it's, it's, a, it's a piece of mathematical uh, maneuvering. So it should be quite straightforward. After you have done all the solution, it comes up with an equation that looks like that, which is actually quite simple. In fact, it is an e equation of, of, of an ellipse. It's an elliptical U e equation. And this elliptical U locus of the modified Kempler is one of the most widely used shape. In fact, I think it is the most widely used shape. Even for structured soil, people assume, they just assume, I just assume that the, the U locus is elliptical because it's such an attractive shape, so simple to use. So when you look at it, the elliptical U locus actually look like that. Okay? Now, of course, this is still P not prime, but you can see that compared to the teardrop, uh, the teardrop has this little thing that stick out here like that, whereas the thing, the elliptical U locus is more rounded. It's more rounded. Is that okay? It's more rounded. So basically, uh, this is how it looks like. And th there is something nice coming out of it. And that is that if you, actually this arrow should be here, right at the x-axis, the p-axis. dash uh, But somehow when I draw it, I wasn't able to shift that arrow exactly right. It's a bit up or a bit down. So I kind of put it a bit up. So if you look at the arrow, this little strain increment vector represented by this arrow over here. Imagine that it is right at this point, right at this point, okay? At the at the tip uh, the, the 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 this this end of the ellipse, okay, uh, at the p dash and on the p dash axis. Obviously, if you take the normal to the curve, that it is going to be pointing horizontally, which means that you only got volumetric strain, no shear strain, which is intuitively more acceptable. All right, intuitively more acceptable. So this is the uh, one of the major advantages of the modified cam clay. And so, most of the time when people talk about cam clay, they are actually referring to modified cam clay. They are actually referring to modified cam clay. Okay? But the, the, the frame of maneuvering the 3D space is all the same. All the same. I'm going to give you a few more equations just so that you can, if you want to do some calculation, you can do some calculation with it. The modified cam clay has several advantages over the original cam clay. A, it matches the real soil data better under conditions of low stress ratio. When we talk about low stress ratio, we are referring to this zone over here. Especially when it is, that means it's near to isotropic compression. It's near to isotropic compression. Okay. So it matches real soil data better. And in particular, under isotropic compression, as we will, as we have already just discussed, Isotropic compression will not give rise to any shear strain increment, which seems to be intuitively more correct. All right, In, which seems intuitively more correct. All right, and under K naught compression, there's one dimensional compression, like in the odometer, you can actually so, show that the modified time clay will give you a K naught less than one, less than one. 
all right but slightly higher than jq maybe about 0.1 what we found what i found was that uh if you go through the mathematics and i have a set of mathematics somewhere if you go through a set of mathematics uh you can actually show that it is on in general about 0.15 to 0.17 higher than jp although i can't say which is right which is wrong okay okay now there are also other differences there are also other differences okay you can look at the original and the modified time clay. For example, when you take the e equation of the ellipse, you take the equation of the ellipse, which is this equation over here, the equation of this thing, and you differentiate it with respect to p dash. Every term differentiated with respect to p dash. Okay, you end up with this equation over here, this equation over here. Now, at critical state, at the critical state, the q over the p prime is zero because it's a turning point. The y over the x is zero. All right, because it's a turning point. So this term will vanish at critical state. And you'll get that at critical state, P prime is equals to P naught prime over 2. You get the condition that at critical state, P naught prime, P prime, which is equals to PC prime at critical state, is equals to the pre-consolidation pressure divided by 2. It's half of the pre-consolidation pressure. Whereas, whereas with the original cam clay, with the original cam clay, this is equals to P C prime equals to P naught prime divided by E. Remember that? E. E is 2.718. So therefore, this is much smaller than this by about 2.7 times. Whereas that for that model, it is only two times. There are models that goes even beyond two times, below two times. Now, what does that mean? That means that this. Supposing now. I have a certain a certain soil for which I know what is P naught prime, for which I know what is P naught prime. Then the original cam. I, let me exaggerate it a little bit so that it is. This is a duster, is it? I think it's, a, it's okay. It's okay. I just I just exaggerate it a bit. This is important uh, for your modeling. P naught prime is over here. All right. So basically. We know that the undrained stress path, remember from our discussion last Friday on the cam clay, the undrained stress path and the A parameter, the undrained stress path tends to hover above the U locus. So if your U locus is like that, you would imagine your undrained stress path to look something like that. And you will hit the critical state line at this point. Agree? Okay? Now for the for the for the for the modified for the modified cam clay with the same p dash value, the p c is somewhere up here already. So basically, you actually got a u locus that that looks like that. All right. So now, if you take the undrained stress path, the undrained stress path went even higher. Go even higher. So therefore, modified cam clay is predicting a less conservative value of the undrained shear strength, the final shear strength. All right. But people in the past believed that the original cam clay predicted a shear strength that is too low. So the modified cam clay is considered to give a more realistic shear strength. Is that alright? More realistic shear strength. Now, imagine now you got a model. You got a model that goes like that and that has a that has a U surface that even go further up like that. This is the U surface. Alright, we don't bother about what happened here, but supposing this is the U surface. What, how would your stress path go? Your stress path will be guided this way. Which means that the guide will reach an even higher predicted shear strength, undrained shear strength. So therefore, it comes back to the same point. The undrained shear strength in some way is related to the shape of your this, um, this side of the U locus. In the extreme, you get a more column, it just goes straight up. Is that okay? Alright. So therefore, the shape of the of the U surface on this side the shape of the U surface on this side, the cap, is actually very, very significant in guiding. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about it later on when we compare the Plexis soft soil model and the cam clay model. And there is some difference. It has been reported, okay, in the 2005 underground Singapore, Wong Kai Sin actually reported a series of studies. He couldn't explain it, but he showed that if you use the soft soil model for the same parameter, it leads you to an undrained shear strength, that, a failure shear strength, at fa undrained shear strength at failure that is about 20% higher than modified cam clay. Okay? He did not say who is right, who is wrong, but you have to bear that in mind because 
you are predicting higher and higher shear strength. So the question is, you don't want to overstep the mark. You, you get what I mean? You don't want to overstep the mark. So this is the this is the the the, the scenario. So essentially, you 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 your 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 U locus your compression cap the shape of your U locus over this side has a has a has a profound effect on how much pore pressure you generate, and therefore what is the unrange shear strength at ultimate failure or at critical state. Okay, let me see what's the next slide. Okay, uh, I don't think I need to cover this one because this part I didn't cover. All I want to say is that uh, they are the same. But before we do that, before we do that, any questions on what we have uh, covered in the last, say, 40 minutes or 45 minutes? Any question at all? I but deliberately went a bit slow because uh, on the I remember when we first started on elasticity, I was uh, I was going quite fast because I kind of take. I kind of figure that you all have some background in elasticity, some background in more coulomb, so we don't have to we don't have to spend a lot of time introducing. But I think that this may be a new thing to a lot of you, so I thought I'd slow down. But is there any question in spite of that? Any question? Yeah. Okay, for the more coulomb, there is a real limitation. For the more coulomb. The associated flow is there is some real limitation because if we will use associated flow in the more coulomb. Remember, you are saying that the angle of dilation equals to the angle of friction, which is far too high. Okay, for the more coulomb. But the difference, okay, the shortcoming of the associated flow is not so obvious for some of the advanced model, which is why in a lot of the advanced model, people still use associated flow. Still use associated, and partly the reason is because if you use non-associated flow, you are actually specifying two surfaces. One is the plastic potential, one is the U locus, U surface. So you need two sets of equation. Whereas with the associated flow, you only need one set. And so that reduces your workload quite a bit. So that's why plexi soft soil model, hardening soil model are all based on associated flow. They don't even talk about it. It's all associated flow. Okay. So the associated flow problem only comes because in more coulomb, you can have very high angle of dilation, but you cannot terminate the dilation. Okay, but with models like cam clay, the dilation is automatically terminated when you reach critical state. So even with associated flow, you cannot have dilation forever. So it's it's not so bad. Okay. So when I talk about associated flow causing problem, it's really in the context of the more coulomb. With the more coulomb, because people who use who try to do more coulomb in the early days, I think there was a paper, I'm not sure whether I, but at least when I was doing my PhD, it was quite a famous or infamous paper. Infamous in the sense that the Cambridge people is a paper by Henkel, Gibson and Drucker. You know Henkel? I think your network Henkel. All right. Henkel is the was the partner, the buddy of Bishop in developing all these triaxial test stuff. Okay. And Gibson is the guy who does uh who does uh, this finite strain consolidation. How many of you have heard of Bob Gibson? R. E. Gibson or something like that. Bob Gibson, okay. Uh, finite strain consolidation. And then Drucker is the guru of plasticity from Brown's University. Okay. There are two of them, Drucker and Prager. You know, Drucker and Prager. Yeah. So Drucker, Daniel Drucker was the, the guru. He was the come up, he was the one who came up with the associated flow. Alright. So when they applied to more coulomb, they found that there was enormous dilation and they can't stop it. And that was the famous paper. That was in geotechnic, I think 1950s or late 40s or early 50s or something like that. I can't remember which is the date now, but I remember seeing that paper before. Okay. So if you are interested, you can go and chase up that paper and, and take a look. Okay. But essentially, the, the, the objection against associated flow was really from the point of view of the more coulomb. Okay. But in fact, a lot of people who use more coulomb with zero angle of friction. Like the Tres, what they call the Tresca model or the Von Mises model, the Tresca model. People who use C equals to Cu and phi dash equals to zero, they don't play with angle of dilation. It's just associated flow. Because even associated flow will give you zero dilation. That's good enough. Okay? So you don't need to you don't specify angle of dilation. You will specify angle of dilation equals to equals to uh, zero. But that will also be associated because the U locus is horizontal. 
You see, if you will specify Cu equals to C dash equals to Cu and phi dash equals to zero, then your more Coulomb failure envelope actually looks like that. In P dash Q, it will still look like that. It is just a horizontal straight line. All right. So if you use zero angle of dilation, it will just be at right angle, and that is associated flow. So I mean, you might as well use associated flow and just forget about the angle of dilation. So even with this, there is no problem. There is no dilation at all. That's why a lot of a lot of material. In fact, the idea of associated flow was that was first started by the people doing plasticity on metals like metal forming and things like that, and they found that it to be reasonably good. That was Daniel Drucker's thing. Brugger and Brugger, they actually found it to be pretty good, all right. But when they apply it to more Coulomb, it just doesn't work. Okay, that was why they bring in this notion about a non-associated flow. Is that okay? All right. Right. Uh, any other question before we move on? Okay. If not, uh. Just uh, want to say a few things. I don't don't worry too much about this lambda lambda. Basically, it's just a vertical separation between the normal compression line. This is the this is the floor of the house. All right. You see two lines there: the normal compression line and the projection of the critical state line. All right. You also see the URL. Now, because of of the fact that with the modified cam clay, this distance is being squeezed to two times instead of two point seven one eight times. It also means that the normal compression line is squeezed come is coming closer to the critical state line, all right. And basically, the vertical separation is lambda minus kappa log two, okay. But this is not really important. The only important thing is that it squeezes your wet zone. Now, earlier on in the critical state soil mechanics, I think the first lecture I mentioned to you that uh, how what do you mean by lightly over consolidated? How over consolidated is lightly over consolidated? And I think I gave a number of Approximately two. Now that is actually from modified cam clay, because you realize that if you squeeze this, so that this is equals to half P C prime, the critical state mean effective stress is half of the P naught prime. Then you realize that this portion, which is really the wet side of critical, right, where you can get the method A problem, is basically this thing is this thing is half of this, which means that when you go back to here, you are O C R equals to two. All right. When you come down to here and then you allow it to swell back to the critical state region, that is OCR two. So the OCR two is is based roughly on the modified cam clay OCR two. So anything roughly about OCR two or less will be considered like can be considered like the over consolidated. Anything that's more than OCR two probably will be heading towards the kind of. Uh, of course, the, there is some difference between different soil, but it will be more like over consolidated. Is that okay? All right, so that comes back to what what we are talking about—the OCR over consolidation ratio of two is roughly taken from the cam clay. Okay, I think the cam the modified cam clay has a better fix on that this limiting over consolidation ratio than the original cam clay, which I think the original cam clay is the original cam clay would have in, would have would have indicated that this but this limiting over consolidation ratio is two point seven one eight, which I think is a bit too high, honestly speaking. I think it's a bit too high. Okay, so yeah. Okay, that is my own personal opinion. So anyway, uh, you don't need to worry about plastic volumetric strain. It's still the same. No change. Plastic volumetric strain. There's no change. Okay. I have already talked about the differences uh, between the cam clay model and uh, modified cam clay model. So I don't think I need to go through. I don't need to go through this uh, at all because. Uh, the main difference is that there is at the point of at this particular point, you actually get a vector that implies pure volumetric strain, which is what you want. Okay. Now, if you plot the if you plot this is an Excel plot of the the work equation, the modified cam clay work equation with the original cam clay work equation, and you can see the original cam clay work equation is exactly the way I is a straight line like I showed just now. Okay. And you can see this straight line coming down all the way down to here. Okay, on the x-axis is delta epsilon VP over delta epsilon SP. On the y-axis is the stress ratio. This shows the modif the original cam clay. This shows the modified cam clay, and you can see the modified cam clay going to infinity. This is roughly what it it looks like. And 
the real data seems to show that this is a bit more accurate. Okay, especially around here. Especially around here, there is a quite a significant difference there. Okay. Okay, now I just quickly go through the behavior of modified chemclay in triaxial test. And this is all in the GeoFEA. Oh, there's a question on the modified chemclay, right? I think you can attempt that. In fact, you might have attempted that already. Okay, so anyway, this is the, anyway, the answer is uh, similar to this. So I'm like giving you what the answer looks like. Okay, now this is a thing from the modified chemclay in the triaxial test. And these are all problems which I solved, which has been solved in the verification problems did I give oh I haven't given you the verification problem yet eh? the triaxial verification problem yeah right yeah right yeah right okay so I need to okay uh, I'll see what I can do in this afternoon uh, after three o'clock maybe I will try to upload some problems up you know but that may I, that may then that seems to be giving you the answer to the assignment before you give me the answer to the assignment, okay. The other way is I give it to you tomorrow morning. I send out the solution, upload the solution tomorrow morning, and you can then download the the, the project file. I upload the project file tomorrow morning, the whole lot, including more Coulomb, everything, all the answers, so that you can bring it bring it back home with you. That completes the learning curve, the loop. Is that okay? Yeah. So I will I will upload it tonight, and during tomorrow morning's lecture. I will flash it on the thing, okay? Or maybe I'll ask you to, you just, I will, can you, if I give you the link tonight, oh, 11 p.m. So don't release the link until tomorrow morning, yeah. Yeah, 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 okay, okay, ah, that'll be great, okay, can? All right, okay, so we do that, right? So basically, we just see how it goes. Basically, uh, essentially, this is how it looks like. Now, this is a drain triaxial compression, like over consolidation ratio of 1.6, sample starting, sample starting with the, U locus here, but the starting point is over here. Okay, so if you take this divided by this, the ratio, which is which we call the over consolidation ratio, is 1.6. Alright, so you start from here. Drain test, drain test the stress path is very boring, it's just 3 to 1, no problem. It first go all the way up to here, hit the U locus, and then continue to go up until it reaches critical state, and that's it. Okay. Now if you look at the stress strain curve, if you look at the stress strain curve, the stress strain curve will Indicate that right at the beginning up to here, it is actually elastic. You see that? It is elastic. But after that, now you can see a progressive strain hardening kind of behavior for, from a normally uh, lightly over consolidated soil. Now, if you look at the compression path, the compression path will tell you that this guy is now starting from here. This is elastic portion. This part here is elastic. That's why it's coming back down along the unloading reloading line. It is along the, and then after that it hits the roof of the house. You know, this is the first part. The first four points is the part where you kind of go this way. You kind of go this way. Then it swing across this way. All right, it swing across this way. So this is the second part here. Is the part where it goes across the roof of the house and hit the critical state line. Any question on this? Okay. Now, we look at the drain triaxial compression on a heavily over consolidated soil. And this was what a question the other day someone asked me as well. So, this is what the stress strain curve and everything looks like. Now, imagine now, imagine now, you start from this as the initial U locus. This one, the, the broken line as the, is the initial U locus. Okay. And this over here is the final U locus. So, the soil starts here. You can see that the OCR is 40 divided by 5. Is about eight. The over consolidation ratio is about eight, so it's pretty heavily over consolidated. So now, if you start to shear the soil, all right. Remember now what happened? You're going to climb up here first. You're going to climb up here first, and then swing down across the critical state line towards the critical state line. Okay. So basically, you see the soil coming up here, coming up here like that. But once you reach here. How does it approach the critical state line? In the drain test, it comes this way. Okay. So here, you can see what is happening. Essentially, you get 
The soil starting from here, this is the unloading reloading line. This is on the elastic wall, and then it swings back towards the critical state line. Is that okay? All right. Now on the stress path, you see coming up to here and then going back down here. On the stress strain curve, this goes like that. Okay. So basically, this is roughly the kind of behavior. Now, you ask me if this is totally accurate. This is not uh, totally accurate because real soil will show a peak, but usually the peak will look like that. The peak will probably look a bit. Correct? Huh? It will look a bit more like that. Not so, not so, there's no sharp corner there and there's no this kind of funny line coming up. Okay? So there is a, there's a different, that's why I mentioned to you, it's okay, thanks. I mentioned to you that uh, the can play is really, really not suitable for heavily over consolidated soil. And I'm going to say a bit more later on, a bit more. The design philosophy that people usually adopt, such as the BS 8002, how they, how, what they, how do you deal with it, you know? Okay? Okay, this is a drain triaxial compression. This is undrained triaxial compression on a lightly over consolidated soil. On a lightly over consolidated soil. Okay, again, the soil has OCR equals to 1.6. 1.6. Okay, and essentially, this is the, the, broken, the broken line is the original U locus. Okay, and this is the original stress point of the soil. OCR is equals to 1.6 and it goes up. This is the total stress path, total stress path over here. This is the effective stress path, it goes up and then this is the plastic portion. So lastly, elastic and then go plastic. But if you reduce the OCR, if you reduce the OCR, the plastic portion will start to increase. Okay, and then you got a curve bending over earlier. Okay, and so basically on the, on the compression curve, it's very boring, it's just a horizontal straight line. Just a horizontal straight line. Now the stress strain curve looks like that, largely elastic but with a small amount of rise over here. Okay. And then the pore water pressure, you can see the pore water pressure increasing. This is excess pore water pressure. So it's showing you positive excess pore pressure. Okay. So this is how the modified cam clay would behave in an undrained condition. Now, if you take a modified cam clay with OCR8, there's a heavily over consolidated kind of modified cam clay, and you shear it undrained, then how will it look like? Okay. Let me just orientate you a little bit. This line here, the broken line, is actually the original U locus. The original U locus. Okay. Uh, and so what happens is that the total stress path, the total stress path is the green, green line. The effective stress path is the blue line. Okay. So when you look at it, the effective stress path is vertical underneath the U, U locus because it's elastic. Remember that? It is elastic. So it is it is vertical under the U locus, so it comes up, hits the U locus, and then it has to follow this V equals to constant condition. It has to follow. So it has to, it, it swings around and moves towards the critical state line. So down here, it swings around and moves towards the critical state line. If you look at the stress strain behavior, it looks like it has gone up a little bit and then come back down kind of thing. Small amount of peak, okay? But the pore water pressure is, uh, interesting because it shows a rise and then a drop. Okay, a rise and then a drop. Now this is the trend. The trend is quite uh, similar, quite similar to triaxial test result. Quite similar. The magnitude of the rise in triaxial test result may not be so high, but the trend is that you, you will first see an initial rise in pore water pressure because of elastic compression. It is actually this part over here. This part over here. This part over here, this thing, this thing, is due to the horizontal offset between the total stress path and the elast and the effective stress path between this portion and this line and this line, the horizontal offset, which is the positive excess pore water pressure. Uh, okay, any question on this? The four cases that I, I showed you, just to demonstrate to you the uh, typical behavior. Of Actually, the, in terms of trend, it is similar to the original cam clay. In terms of number, it is somewhat more accurate. Okay.
Okay, the undrained stress path, I won't talk about the undrained stress path, I just want to summarize, uh, you see this is part of the mathematics, remember I did a bit of the mathematics with you, okay, I have consciously tried to steer clear of a lot of mathematics, but in 6101 when uh, Prof. Juneja was there and a lot of people uh, subsequent, I actually power them with mathematics because you need mathematics to give exam questions, you know, especially questions that will kill them, so uh, that's why I give them a lot of mathematics and the questions are very tricky. So, uh, but anyway, but with, with this course, because one of the problem with this course in your case is because you are doing it over two weeks. Those blocks are doing it over one semester. There are plenty of time to internalize over a whole semester. Three hours a week, three hours a week. They can go back and they can discuss, they can do assignments and things. They can actually understand the concept. But with, I can appreciate that with just over a week, it is kind of like a information overload kind of thing. Just come in, you know. So we have to, yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I appreciate that, that. That that that's why I cut down a bit of the mathematics. And the other thing they always tell us is this: in seminar, for every equation you show, you half the audience. Okay, your audience will decrease by half. You show one equation, fifty percent. So two equation, twenty five percent. The third equation you show twelve and a half percent, and so on and so forth. And very soon you end up with almost no audience. Okay, so this is the this is the situation. So I try not to show the equation, but essentially this is the same kind of math set of mathematics that I introduce you to in the cam clay, the original cam clay. I just want to summarize one thing: the difference in terms of equation, the difference between the modified cam clay and the original cam clay. And I apologize for the mess this table comes out in. I couldn't. Uh, I I think I really need to do something about it. When I go back, I'll do something about it. Okay, essentially, uh, the way I organize it, actually the top part is not important. Uh, the, the one is just, it's the same as before. It's the same as before as the original template. But the bottom part is the part where I did all the summary. Okay, you got the you, you got the, 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 the U locus here, or the original template. This is, this referred to the U locus, this thing. For some reason, this guy somehow appeared on this row rather than this row. By right, it's supposed to appear on this row. The word U locus. So this is the U locus of the original cam clay. Ooh. This is the U locus of the modified cam clay. All right, this is the elliptical equation. Elliptical equation. All right. Now don't worry about uh, this one here. This is actually the, if you like, uh, the flow rule is some kind of is some version of the flow rule. But don't worry about that. Okay. Now the undrained stress path for normally consolidated soil. For the original cam clay, I think I already shown you by mathematics, this is the undrained stress path. Okay, remember this one over capital lambda? That's the guy that allows it to go above the U locus. And lambda, capital lambda is lambda minus kappa over lambda. Okay, now for the modified cam clay, you can express it as something like that. Express it as something like that. Okay, or this, or this. Okay. Or this. Now, this has a similar effect. This thing here has a similar effect. Beta is defined as kappa over lambda minus kappa. Okay, beta is defined as defined as kappa over lambda minus kappa. All right. Now, you might ask, okay, what is the range of beta? Okay, what is a typical ratio between kappa and lambda? Maybe about uh, 0 0.25, 0 0.2. Maybe 0.1. That's the kind of ratio between what is the ratio between a compress a, a swell a swelling index and a compression index? Maybe about one ten to one fifth to one third. That kind of thing, right? One fifth, more like one fifth to one ten. So maybe twenty percent, point two to point one kind of thing. So basically, if you look at that, if kappa equals to point one lambda, this is point one divided by point nine, so it's about eleven percent. This is about point one one. So beta will be about point one one. If kappa equals to 0.2 of lambda, this will be 0.2 over 0.8, that will be 0.25. So beta will be ranging between 0.11 and 0.25. That's the rough range of beta. Okay. So basically, if you look at that, now if you look at this equation, this part here is actually the original cam clay equation. The original cam clay equation. All right. It's just that you've got another portion over here. This portion is pi over p, p dash which in a normally consolidated soil is always greater than 1 because your starting mean effective stress is always the highest. The stress path will go the other way. So the mean effective stress is always reducing. It's always reducing. So therefore, Pi over P dash 
is always greater than 1. This group of these two terms, the ratio here is always greater than 1. So now you have something that is greater than 1 raised to the power of a fraction, maybe 0.11 to 0.25. It will still be greater than 1. It's just not so much greater than 1. You, you know what I mean? Huh? It's just slightly greater than 1. So basically, this, this term here will always be greater than 1. However, when kappa equals to 0, what happened? Beta will be 0, right? Beta will be 0. When beta equals to 0, this becomes 1. And this falls, this becomes the modified time clay U locus equation. So basically, same thing, when the swelling index is 0, when the swelling index is 0, immediately the, in, the undrained stress path follows the U locus. Alright? When the swelling index is not zero, it tends to go slightly above the U locus. So essentially, it's the same thing, except that equation-wise, it is slightly different. Is that okay? All right. So essentially, this is the the important thing. Now, there's also this crit the critical state line no change. Critical state line no change. The normal compression line there's a slight change. There's a log two over here, but I didn't I didn't mention this part earlier, so I don't think you need to take care take worry too much about this. Okay, the last term, uh, I'm not going to talk about how we get this equation because there's another set of mathematics involved and it's going to put everybody to sleep. So, I just want to, I just want to define for you what is the state boundary surface. The state boundary, there are a few names uh, that when you read books, uh, you will always come across. The first is called the state boundary surface. The roof of this house is the state boundary surface. Alright, essentially the roof of this house. All right. Why? Because the so the state of the soil can be on this surface or underneath this surface, but not above this surface. That's why it's called the state boundary surface. It forms the boundary of all the states of the soil. All right. And the Cambridge people only. The Cambridge people likes to call this. The Imperial College hates this. All right. The Cambridge people likes to call this part of the surface, which is on the wet side, the state boundary surface. On the website, they call it the Roscoe surface. So when you read books, sometimes you'll see the word Roscoe surface. The Imperial College people hate Roscoe. So they don't want to call it the Roscoe surface. They call it some other thing. All right? They call it a state boundary surface. They don't even use the word wet site. The wet site is a Cambridge term. All right? But the Cambridge people who write books will like to use call this the Roscoe surface in memory of Ken Roscoe. All right? Okay? So this is also called a Roscoe surface. The whole thing is called state boundary surface. Okay? So, this just gives you the equation of the state boundary surface if you are curious about it or interested to know about it. But uh, I don't think it is actually all that important from the practical viewpoint. From the practical viewpoint. Okay? So, essentially, this I think uh, this brings us to the end of the modified cam clay. And I just want to recap by saying what is the advantage of cam clay over more coulomb. Uh, firstly, you know that for normally consolidated soil, soft soil and uh, lightly over consolidated soil, it actually is able to prescribe a stress path that is sort of turning towards the left and building up excess pore water pressure. So that gives you something that is closer to the soil, real soil behavior and it solves the method A problem. Okay, and uh, it the inclusion of the pre-consolidation pressure. Now, in GeoFEA, if you put in OCR, over-consolidation ratio, into a more column, you will just ignore it. It will just ignore it. It doesn't take, take notice of it. In the cam clay model, it will take notice of it. So basically, the cam clay model allows the, the, the pre-consolidation pressure to be included so that you can specify behavior for lightly over-consolidated, normally, over, normally consolidated, and heavily over-consolidated soil. So that is actually, there is a bit more freedom over there. Okay, now, Cam Clay actually specifies a, its own definition of failure. Okay, now you can agree or disagree. Some people disagree with it, that's fine. The state of ultimate failure, which is the critical state, huh, the state of ultimate failure, is actually reached in both the drain and undrained condition when the effective stress, the void ratio, and the shear stress are no longer changing with the shear strain. All right. This is the actual definition that critical state soil mechanics use. The critical state is the failure state. All right. The peak strength is not considered the failure state. If you look at the, if you look at this problem, this is the interesting part because if you look at this thing, uh, this one here, this is the peak strength. 
the camp clay people never think of this as a failure state. It is thinks of it as this guy reaching the use you envelope. You know what I mean? It's the initial yielding. And when you read the, the our paper on the cohesive camp clay, which is for cement treated soil, we actually adopt the same thing. But because what we found is that you reach a peak when the first thing first start to yield. Because when you when you when you when you load cement treated soil, initially there's a lot of cementation. A lot of cementation. The thing is very hard. Alright? A lot of bonding, chemical bond. And then the moment it starts to shear, the chemical bond all starts to break up. So actually the cohesion actually drop. Because that it is actually degrading. Alright? So originally the you that you will hit the peak peak strength and then it starts to come down. That's the way it works. So essentially you can see similar thing happening. So essentially this point here is not considered failure. The failure is somewhere up out here. That's the critical state when it reaches here. There is a a, a clear definition of failure. Remember I told you the story of Mike Duncan doing a survey and people talking about what is failure, strength, what strength to use and all that sort of thing. We will come back to it because the BS8002 is very clear on this issue. Whether you should be using the peak strength or the critical state strength. Okay, the excess pore pressure generation is better model. Okay, uh, and you can model uh, positive or negative excess pore pressure, but more coulomb can only model up to from negative to zero excess pore water pressure because depending on your angle of dilation. If your angle of dilation is positive, you will get negative excess pore water pressure. If your angle of dilation in the undrained test, uh, if your angle of dilation is zero, you get no pore pressure. All right. So that is a, the, the thing that the limitation of the more coulomb. Okay. And the peak strength in heavily over consolidated soil can be modeled qualitatively. This is the important point. Qualitatively, not quantitatively. All right. Okay. The peak strength is differentiated from the ultimate or critical state strength. So this is the some of the contributions, what I see to be the contribution of camp clay over the more coulomb. And that it, I think one of the important things about cam clay all said and done uh, is that, uh, okay, we'll talk about some of the limitations of cam clay in a sh short while after the tea break, I think. After the tea break, we'll continue with that and then go into real soil modeling. So that will bring us nicely to the end of the morning session. But, but essentially, uh, I just want to wrap up by saying that what I personally find useful about the cam clay model is that you know, whereas when we learn about soil behavior, they always say, oh, over consolidated soil, you have this normally. But Cam Clay gives you a, a bookshelf by which you can kind of organize all these thoughts into nice little thing. And, and so when you look at new soil behavior, I'm not saying that Cam Clay will capture everything, but when you end up with something new, you kind of say, okay, this is something new to the bookshelf and I can organize it accordingly on this. You know what I mean? It gives you something, a very nice way of organizing your your thought, your concepts about soil behavior. So this, this is really what I thought is nice about the critical state soil mechanics. Okay. Now, before we break up for morning tea, any questions? I think Prof. Junaja told you like, the other day, if you can understand time play, modify time play, it's a breeze, no issue. All right. Mathematically, yeah, there are some differences in the mathematics, but let us not get sidetracked by the mathematics. Let's stay to the main concepts of the whole thing. Okay. I mean, of course, if you are doing PhD in constitutive modeling, then you have no choice but to grind through the mathematics. But my point is that uh, if you are not doing a PhD, you don't need it. I mean, if, especially if you are practicing engineer, you are just sort of using models as they come. Okay. Any question? If not, then can we break for tea and then we can come back maybe 11, 11.05. Uh, we, have, we are quite flexible. I mean, if you are a bit late, it's okay. We'll just wait for a Okay. Okay. Ken? All right. Ken, thanks very much for your attention.